there are a lot of people who signed up for resetting your energy. <laughs> I'm Beth from Cornell Wellness, and I am delighted to once again welcome David Andelman back to talk to us about meditation and resetting your energy. Um, David has been doing meditation all around the world for many years, and I'm sure he'll share some stories with you. But for this time with him, please settle in, relax, and enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Is this, can you guys hear this? Maybe if I talk right, right into it. That's weird. You know, one person wants to sit in the front row. <laughs> I don't spit that much. I saw a bumper sticker that said, meditation go nowhere fast. <laughs> We're gonna spend an hour going nowhere and you're gonna feel amazing afterwards. I think I literally have to touch this to make it work. Are we all, we're gonna get started with another minute or two? Yep. Okay, everyone. How's everyone doing? Has that, who here has been to one of my sessions before? What? Are you kidding? What's really wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> End of the semester, I get it. Reset the energy class. I was going through, uh, I'll introduce myself in stuff in a minute, but I was going through a lot of uh, the feedback forms that, that you all filled out, and I was like, whoa! This is amazing. There was like, it probably took me 20 or 30 minutes to get through it, and I could teach for weeks, if not months, on all the topics you guys asked about. So I, I might not get to everything, but uh, I will leave some time at the end if you can stay longer for some questions and answers, if you like. So welcome, 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 welcome. So good to see everyone here. Um, it's nice that the semester is over. Maybe things will calm down a little bit. And today's topic is on resetting energy, resetting our energy. And we'll get into that in a minute, but first I just wanted to start out by sharing a little bit about my journey, how I got into teaching meditation, how I got into meditating, um, and then we'll go from there. Has anyone uh, ever been to India before? One of you, two of you? Cool. You made it out alive? That's good. <laughs> just kidding. Um, when I was a teenager, I used to literally sit on the internet uh, and just look at websites of ashrams in India and go, I want to go live in an ashram in India. <laughs> and I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey, and my parents were like, what the hell is wrong with this kid? <laughs> Why did you do that? So when I was 16, come on in, come on in. Just, I'm going to tell my whole life story, we're going to meditate for two minutes at the end. <laughs> my grandfather and my grandfather is a lovely man, he's in his eight, late 80s. My grandson teaches people how to relax. I've been trying to get my wife to do that for 60 years. She doesn't listen. <laughs> it's a whole other story. <laughs> when I was a teenager, my brother came from home from college. He said, David, you've never read a book in your life. And I said, that's correct. <laughs> I didn't like to read. I played hockey all day long. And he dragged me to a Barnes and Nobles. I literally grabbed the first book I saw because he said I had to buy a book. It happened to be a meditation book. I got home, I opened it, and my entire life changed. Within like two or three pages, my, there was like a light bulb just went off in my head. And that light bulb, it was, it was a very simple concept, and it was one that I had, I had never thought of before until that moment. And something in me just, it just clicked. And it was a very this, this concept that. Uh, most of us, most of the time, our consciousness is projecting out into the future and back into the past. And the present moment is almost like this, this little touch-off point, we come and go, right? But mostly, we're, we wake up in the morning, we project out into the day, we'll go to bed, we project out into the next day, we might be taking a walk through campus and we start thinking about something that happened in the past, and it's very difficult for us to be present. And that's why there's so many people interested in mindfulness and meditation now, is because our society is pulling us into the future harder and harder. It's just like this, this gravity that's like hard to uh, almost like fight off. We're planning, planning, and planning, creating, creating for the future. And uh, that will only take you so far until at a certain point it gives you diminishing returns, where you're never enjoying anything in the present moment. And then even when you try, can't because there's just too much momentum in your head. Anybody have that momentum going on in your head? I see a lot of nods. <laughs> Got that momentum. Um, and then, so everyone's trying to reverse that process. 
One, one easy way would be to jump out of an airplane and go skydiving. That'll shoot you right into the moment. <laughs> For about two minutes, <laughs> then you'll have to go back to work. Uh, high impact sports, really great music, losing yourself in art. Uh, there are many things that pull us into the moment, but then when we finish them, we kind of get to go back into that other space, of projecting out into the future and back into the past. And so when I recognized this as a teenager, I just sat down and started meditating a lot. Like I would sit and close my eyes for hours. I was like, this is amazing. I don't have to be in the future all the time. Uh, and it came so naturally to me. But I didn't meet another person that meditated for maybe four years, four or five years until the end of college. And it, it was where I grew up. It just wasn't a thing. Nobody was meditating. Uh, now I go back to New Jersey and I teach workshops and classes and everyone and their mother and father is meditating. It's like, it's the cool thing now. So I wasn't cool, now I'm cool. All because they sit still. <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> oh my god, he's really good at sitting still. Woo! Oh my goodness. <laughs> you realize I have no skill set, right? <laughs> Just sit still. <laughs> and it's the hardest thing to sit still. Isn't it? We close our eyes to meditate, and, and it's just, we, our minds just keep on moving. And a lot of people, when they start to meditate, they think that they're supposed to hold their body and their mind hostage into stillness. Like, you just shut up. <laughs> that's, my that's my mantra. Shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> so that's the way to enlighten me. <laughs> Even if you're saying ohm, right? If you're ohming, you might really be saying shut up in a deeper way. <laughs> shut up, you know? So uh, how do we really approach this in a way where it's going to work? I think for most people, from my experience with teaching, if I tell you all to sit, close your eyes, and just watch your breath, you'll probably meditate for a few days, maybe a few weeks, and then you'll be like, this is bored, this is boring, or this is really hard, and then you'll go on to something else. So my approach is a little bit different. I like to go deep. I like to find out like, what's really going on in somebody's psyche. Like what energy are they holding on to that they can't let go of? What do they need to do to take their next step in life? And what is it that's really blocking them from shifting? I think when we really find a sense of happiness and fulfillment, our minds will relax naturally. Because they'll just go, oh, we're here. And they'll start to subside. So last week we worked on anxiety, and we talked about how a lot of our anxiety can be caused by deeper layers of emotions that we haven't processed. And so we went into a pretty deep meditation on finding some of those places and images that are still stuck. Uh, and the same can be said for resetting our energy because we want to reset our energy, but we get stuck like in an old pattern. We get stuck in the past. Or maybe we get stuck in the pattern of always thinking about the future. And it gets hard to reset our energy, especially when we're surrounded by people uh, who are all doing the same thing. So if you're on a hamster wheel, there's a bunch of other people, on hamsters on hamster wheels, they're like, oh, I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> but what I would say to that is, you're all crazy. <laughs> this whole room, you're all crazy as hell. Uh, <laughs> and just because you're all surrounded by each other, you validate that it's okay to be crazy. But if I was to externalize what was going on in your head on this board, everyone would run out of this room in like five seconds. <laughs> like, ah, right, it's just chaos. It would be chaos up here. Right? 17 different thoughts in nine seconds on 10 topics. Uh, regret, jealousy, fear, anger, frustration, hope. <laughs> Total blackout, where am I? <laughs> like that one blank. <laughs> Someone just sleep in the back. <laughs> so we take for granted this thing going on in our heads, but I think the only difference between a, what we see as what we think of as a sane person and a crazy person is that the crazy person is saying out loud what the same person is having going on inside their heads. That's the only real difference between most people. It's of like degree, right? It's of degree. You're, and I bet some of you talk out loud. I can see it. <laughs> you talk out loud, we all do sometimes. So how do we rein it in? This could be one of the main questions today. So I started meditating at 16. I read hundreds of books. I had books stacked to the ceiling. I couldn't sell. I was obsessed. I went to college. The only thing I could think of majoring in was philosophy. It came close. I graduated. I moved to Europe. I lived in the Himalayas for a long time. Uh, I explained the Beatles earlier. I love the Beatles. 
I used to live in the ashram uh, next to the ashram the Beatles lived in. That, the one they lived in closed down like four years ago. But I lived in the one next door. Uh, the energy there is still pretty cool on the Andes River in the Himalayas, uh, doing yoga and meditating all day long. And I honestly thought at a certain point I would do that forever. And then I needed this thing called money. Interesting. Uh, and like, you know, career, life path, relationships. So I decided to come back into society eventually. And I lived in Hawaii for a long time, training, teaching. And now I'm here uh, teaching at universities and corporations and yoga studios, all sorts of cool places. Cornell's definitely my favorite place to teach. <laughs> it actually is. I love it here. My brother has a beautiful farm right down the road, so I come and I stay in the farm and relax. And all I do is teach here a couple times. It's so nice. Um, so I lived in the Himalayas. I learned how to meditate deeply, and then eventually I wanted to learn how to share it. But what I found was when I told everyone, just sit still for an hour, <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> you know, career path kind of stopped right there. Um, <laughs> So I realized uh, we're too far gone for, for that, for most of us, to, to start there. So what I like to do is start more with, with visualizing, with recognizing energy, with becoming, by becoming aware of what our energy is like, how it's moving, where it's stuck. On a lot of your forms, I, I saw some of you write, uh, I want to learn how to let go of negative energy. I want to learn how to unmatch from people who are full of negativity around me. I want to stop healing the people in my life that can't be healed and give away all my energy to them. Uh, those are some very, very interesting topics that I love to approach. And when we go to reset our energy, we have to approach those topics because that's what's changing our energy. So if you live inside of a bubble, so we, have a, we all have a number of bubbles. One bubble might be our family bubble, right? Uh, the crazy bubble. <laughs> call it the crazy bubble. And we go in there into that bubble, and some of us, we freak out, and we go, I don't like the energy here, it's intense. Some of us love it, it's amazing. Uh, but it, a lot of people, it'll be, that'll be an intense bubble. Um, and we also have a work bubble. We go to work at a place like Cornell, it'll tend to be very analytical, and that has its own kind of energy to it, right? Being very rational all day. Like, it would be appropriate for you, maybe a little bit appropriate, to be able to get frustrated, and maybe even a little angry at work, but if you started tearing up and really emoting at work, then it would probably be almost inappropriate, right? So we get kind of pushed into a range of behavior that's acceptable and not acceptable. And in that range, we start to get set in a certain type of behavior and a certain type of energy. So our energy almost gets set for us. And then we get out of work, and we want to go do something totally different, right? Like let loose, let go, be free, be open. Um, and, and then we have lots of other bubbles. We have bigger bubbles, like societal bubbles, right? So the state of New York maybe has a bubble of energy. The country of the United States has a bubble of energy. Sometimes that one can be pretty intense. <laughs> Sports teams have bubbles of energy. I used to be captain of a, my ice hockey team uh, in high school and then in college, and we would all wear red, we would all chant the same thing, the crowd would chant, and it could feel that like defense, right? Defense, hi. <laughs> Meditate. <laughs> what I do with my family. Defense. <laughs> and so there's all these bubbles we go into, and then we match the energy of that bubble. Like if you're in a sports crowd and everyone's chanting, we match that. Or at a political rally, we match that. And then you become, there's that like mob mentality. And it, it even happens with couples, right? You'll see they they wear one sweatshirt and it kind of like there's only two arms and they're both in it. Or uh, the couples that wear the same exact clothes, <laughs> like the polka dot yellow shirt <laughs> with the khakis, and they go everywhere together and they look identical. And so they're matching each other. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey where everyone has a little bit of an accent. I don't know if you've ever heard it. <laughs> Friends of mine will be like. Yo, Dave, what are you doing over there, like teaching meditation and stuff up there? What are you, what are you doing? I don't understand. <laughs> so when we live in a place, we might need to match the energy with the way that we speak, right? Some cultures are very intellectual. Some are very uh, emotional. Some are very tribal. I've lived in a lot of third world countries where I've lived in places where the center of gravity was less intellectual and more connected to nature. And so people would behave differently and they had less stress because they weren't, so, they weren't such mental creatures. So we, we take the bubbles that we live in for granted, 
and often we don't recognize how much they set the energy for us versus us setting our own energy. So when we meditate, we start to set our energy for ourselves. So what is my intention today? What am I creating? What does my energy feel like? Now a lot of us don't know what our energy feels like because there's so much other stuff going on and so much input. It's like floods in when we wake up, right? Through the phone, through email, through text, and then in person too. Some of us are very porous with our boundaries. And so somebody comes up to you with their negativity or pain and they start dropping their story on you and you absorb it. <laughs> you ever have one of those people just like drop a nice big chunk of pain on you and you absorb it and you go away feeling worse? Uh, and so now they've set the energy for you. Other people are like, I'm not taking that, but then they come off mean. <laughs> Might be a nice middle ground. A lot of us are very empathic, and so we'll absorb the energy of the world through feeling. We'll go around and we'll feel everything. Anybody here love to hide in their house and never go to social function? <laughs> oh my god, not the rooms? <laughs> Except this one group, this is a safe space. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons we're so empathic that if we go into a room with too many people and we don't like the energy of the room, we'll start to feel it in ourselves and we won't feel good and then we'll, we'll want to be alone. So if that happens to you, you might just be kind of very energetically sensitive to people. You might have to learn how to manage that energy. Some of us are very mentally sensitive. So like there's, it's almost like a flood of mental activity just passing through like a cell phone tower <laughs> or a air, airport, uh, air control, whatever it's called, for, for airplanes, uh, and, and just the signals are coming through all day long. And so we have to learn how to recognize these energies, let them go, and then we'll be able to find out who we really are and how we actually feel. So a lot of people will sit in meditation to find their answers. Like, I want to know what to do with my life. What's my next step? Is this career path really for me? Is this the right partner? Uh, is this the right creative project? And we look for these answers, we close our eyes and we look for these answers, but we close our eyes and all we get is noise. But there's always noise. Mental noise and emotional noise. So until we start differentiating between the noise that belongs to us and the noise, the noise that doesn't, it's really difficult to find our answers. Uh, so if, for example, if you are very empathic and you spend all day as a counselor, you know, working with people, helping them, helping them, one way or another, healing them, holding space for them, giving them advice, and you're empathic, you might take a little bit of their pain away with each person that you work with, and then you go, all right, I'm gonna meditate, close my eyes, and find out some of my own answers, and you do that, and then all you get is noise, and like seeming frustration, resentment, guilt, different weird forms of pain, where you're like, this doesn't make any sense, I'm a happy person, and I feel depressed. And you might just be absorbing all of that pain from people. I have a, uh, a family member who's a doctor. Actually, he went to, he went to Cornell, and it was his idea. I come teach here originally, so thank you. But he, he would tell me that after every patient he sees, he's completely exhausted. Like each patient, just like, he's so sensitive to what they're going through, and their needs are so intense because some of them think they could be dying, and so they, they run that need through him of like, you know, save me. And that, that could be very intense if we don't know how to handle it. And so we have to recognize how to have really good energetic boundaries. And when we do that, some of that noise will naturally subside and our answers will come up in a faster, easier way that are recognizable. So for me, sitting and meditating is about resetting our energy and then seeing what it is that we want to create next. Now yes, you might just sit in total stillness and, and in bliss, and that's perfect. Uh, but sometimes you also might want to go, all right, I have a lot to work on today, I have a lot to create. Let me step into the day with an energy that, that's positive, that works for me, and, and not in a space of negativity. So how do I shift my energy to be in that space first thing in the morning so I can create a really positive, healthy day? That's the direction we're going to take it in today. And I don't want to pretend that meditating is a magic bullet that will do everything for you. There, there are no magic bullets. It takes a lot of work. I spent 10 years meditating and only doing nothing else. Um, and I'm still just a beginner in a lot of ways. So it does take work like anything to master. <laughs> I was living in India and I had a friend who literally, he could meditate on the floor for three hours in lotus on like a, 
on a hardwood floor, stone floor, without moving. And I thought this guy was like the Buddha. I'm like, no, he's amazing. I can only sit for like 40 minutes. <laughs> he must be perfect. <laughs> and so one, one day we got out of this meditation retreat and we went to have lunch and he like put his foot up on like this chair at the next table and some guy in India was like, excuse me, my friend, can you take your foot down? And my buddy was just like, no. You <laughs> could see like devil eyes of rage coming out of him. It's like a years of, of childhood frustration and anger just pouring out of his face, having nothing to do with the situation. Just yelling at this guy. He just like snapped. All out of someone saying, did you put your foot down? And it was all of this stuff inside of him. And I was like, how, how is this possible? If this guy has all of that, then what chance do the rest of us have? <laughs> So, so I started thinking, like, why is this professional meditator snapping at the littlest things? And what I recognized was he was sitting still, but he wasn't processing anything. So from the outside, somebody can look like a great meditator, but they're not, they're not really processing or doing anything. It was, at the end of the day, I can guide you as much as possible, but you have to consciously make the decision that you want to do the work from the inside out. Nobody can do it for you. Uh, and, and I also realized he was always just sitting watching his breath, which was great, but what happens when like a really disturbing emotion comes up, or some childhood abuse, or some, some really stuck energy around a relationship? You have no tools to deal with that, and then you just sit there and look at it and go, oh, meditating's terrible. <laughs> All my pain comes up. What is this, pain hour? I'm done. <laughs> Why would I do this? I'll exercise, because at least then I'm moving and it doesn't bother me. So we, have, we need tools to be able to deal with some of this. So let's, let's do a, a nice kind of light introduction to meditation. We'll close our eyes. I always say that and we go deep. How's everyone doing? Can we take a nice deep breath in and large sigh out? Like a, uh, uh. Anything in your life isn't going right. Don't worry, in the second meditation, we'll find someone to blame it on. And the blame meditation, you can find it free on my website. Uh, the most popular one. So go ahead and close your eyes. Let those shoulders relax. Let yourself breathe nice and lightly. And I mentioned this before, you don't have to control your body. You don't have to hold a hostage in any way. It should be just as much as in ease and relaxed as at any other time. So we can't force ourselves to reset energy, right? We can't wish with a positive thought that we're gonna feel better and everything is gonna change. If that worked all the time, we wouldn't be here. We'd be on an island with millions of dollars raining down. <laughs> Just kidding, that's not what I would do. So relax. Step into your body a little bit more. There's no better doorway into the present moment than your physical body. It can't go into the past or the future with you. It will just sit there in the chair going, where did you go? And if you really don't come back, you'll start creating this thing called stress and anxiety. And then if you really don't come back, it might create physical ailments. And you can almost surf your breath into your body. So ride your breath into your body with your awareness. And 
what I'd like you to do is just notice as you do that, where inside yourself have you been lacking giving yourself enough attention? So is it in the heart? Have you been lacking giving your heart enough attention? Or in your lower abdomen, your emotional space? In your head, in your conceptual space, creative space? So we're not doing anything about it, we're just becoming aware. So maybe there is no place, but just check. Where have you been absent from? For example, if you're only giving your heart 20% of what it needs, and it's lacking 80% of the attention it needs, then your mind trying to solve that might just continue to pace and race, trying to find a way to solve it. And so just by acknowledging it, you can almost like settle your mind down and just show it, hey, you don't have to solve this, I'm just becoming aware of the energy. And the first thing that we do when we recognize what we might think is a quote-unquote a problem is we go into solving mode. And that works really well for math problems, for physics, for mechanical engineering, but it doesn't always work really well when we go inwards. Because if you look, for example, at your heart and you go, that's a problem, with that level of judgment, the heart actually closes more. So often as we start to meditate, the first thing we do is we make ourselves a problem that needs to be solved. And now there's two of us. There's me, and there's the problem that needs to be solved. So you've divided yourself. So instead, notice there's not a problem that needs to be solved, you're just becoming aware of energy. And whatever form it takes for you, I might be pointing at the heart, but it might be a totally different thing. So just go with whatever you notice. Just the space that's been lacking the attention that it needs. Notice your reaction to when you find out what that is. There might be judgment, there might be sadness, there might be that need to fix it and heal it, or some of us will go into blaming someone else for it, or we're, we'll blame ourselves. Or we're uh, equal opportunity blamers. We blame someone else and ourselves. So I invite you, instead of thinking of this as a problem, to notice that actually maybe it is the next step on your life path that's really important to you, that has meaning and purpose and that it's not a problem, it's actually the purpose. So we'll call this meditation from problem to purpose. And then what I want you to do is just check in with yourself, whatever part of you it is, 
and ask it what it needs. And let it answer. So it might not be your head that answers. You're not doing anything. You're just checking. What is it that you need? And notice how good it feels to become aware of what you need. That in and of itself is a healing. You might even notice as you do that, that the energy in the space will start to shift. Just with that acknowledgement. Like there's a deep okayness. It's okay to need something. It's okay to need a healing. It's okay to need help, support, love. And that you're not a problem. You are a purpose that's unfolding. tell you what you need more than you can tell yourself. You're the only person on the inside. And meditation is an inside job. There is no expert in you. tool to go along with, with this. So whatever it is that you're working on, just allow it to be there. You're not going to do anything about it for right now. It's just kind of unfolding with this awareness. And what I'd like you to do is notice from the base of your spine, all of a sudden, a nice big tree trunk just starts to grow down into the earth. Whatever kind of tree you prefer, maybe it's as wide as your chair, nice and sturdy, right into the planet. And it roots in, big roots, right into the earth. And this tree grounds you, it grounds your body. And most importantly, it grounds what you're working on so you don't float away with it. I've never seen a tree float away. Well, once, but we were in college, and it's a long story. So as this tree trunk roots into the earth, it's almost like your psychic seatbelt. You're here, you're on this planet, you've decided to take on 
whatever it is that you're working on, even if it's pretty difficult, and you're going to do it in a grounded way. Now here's the coolest part. All of a sudden, from this tree trunk, a branch grows out. And it grows into whatever part of your body you've noticed that you've been, that you've been working on, this space that is going from problem to purpose. So if it's the heart, this tree branch grows into the heart. If it's the head, it grows up there. If it's the stomach, it grows into the stomach. And when the tree branch gets there, a leaf blooms. A nice, vibrant, green leaf. And then the leaf actually starts to absorb whatever is kind of ready to let go, to be let go of in this space for you. So if there's been frustration or tension in the heart, resentment, anger, guilt, shame in the stomach, excessive thoughts, analytical energy in the head, it starts to absorb it. Maybe almost like a tree will absorb water and then it'll go down into its root system. So it starts to travel down this tree branch into the trunk and then it drains into the earth. floated away or we lost track of where we were going, that's totally fine. That's some of the energy that you're letting go of. Maybe every time you go to process something, you, you float away. Good. So now you can even drain the energy of that floating away. Some of us, when we hit pain, we leave. Some of us, when we hit pain, we fight. Some of us cry, some of us complain. Some of us become victims. Some of us blame. Life is fun, huh? <laughs> Every time I get too serious, I always pull up a picture of a little kitty on my phone. Just watch it. <laughs> so notice how seriously you've been taking this. Maybe you've been stuck in it for a while, trying to solve it. So instead of solving it, I invite you to just allow the energy on it to start to drain off. Maybe it's like a liquid with a color, like ew, icky resentment. of most of the energies that we work on, we tend to find one of two things. One, we haven't been loved enough in some way. We didn't get the love that we needed. The other, we're not good enough in some way. There's invalidation there. We're just not good enough yet the way we are. Body type, mental state, wealth, relationship, in one form or another, we're not quite good enough yet. 
when a problem that needs to be solved. Could you imagine walking up to a rose and saying, you're pretty nice, but your red's a little pale. Best of luck to you. Notice your space starting to lighten up. I think enlightenment is when we let go of all this and then our light shines from the inside out. But it can't shine if the windshield is covered or stuck. So we're not just feeling, but we're seeing. We're seeing the shift happen. There's another great bumper sticker that says, shift happens. <laughs> we might be fighting and fighting and fighting in meditation, and then it just happens. All of a sudden, something just drops. You don't have to be smart, you don't have to be a good person, you don't have to be right. None of that is going to help you in meditation. You just have to be willing to acknowledge where you actually are, how you feel, and what energy is actually there. And take the judgment off so you can let it go. That's it, that's the whole thing. start to notice you can feel yourself a little more. Ooh. Oh. Maybe a little bit more breathing room. A little bit more space. When you're ready, I want you to take a nice big deep breath in. Nice sigh out. Uh, Pat yourself on your energetic back. Uh, and this might still continue the process, but when you're ready, you can slowly, slowly come out of meditation, stretch, open your eyes. I remember I was in Hawaii meditating for a few years. I really shifted things in myself. I went back to New Jersey to visit some relatives. And one of them looked at me and said, man, David, you look so different. Did you cut your hair? And it reminded me of when the hobbits and Lord of the Rings, they go on this epic journey. They drop the ring into the volcano. They make it all the way back to the Shire alive. And the other half of are like, did you go somewhere? <laughs> your hair looks a little different. So the more we shift our energy from the inside out, the more it'll start to show from the outside in. So people may or may not know what that is, but you can start to know what that is. And that was a pretty long meditation. I was going to do a short one to start, but then I was just looking at everybody and going like, no, let's just run with it. Um, how was that for everyone to recognize kind of where you, maybe there's a leak, what you need to work on? Not in an intellectual way. You'll notice I gave you very few prompts, right? I didn't give you some concept to chew on like a bone where you can spit out about it forever. <laughs> All I said was, what's going on, right? Because if you look inside, what's going on? What needs work? Where is it? Because the unconscious 
can be much more like a kindergarten of some kind. Our rational mind can create endless stories, but the unconscious mind might just be like, I need love now, right? It might just say, give me a cookie, <laughs> whatever it is. And, and so we have to put down our intellectual sword, otherwise we're gonna cut ourselves into pieces, right? We try to heal ourselves by cutting ourselves into a thousand pieces. But if you took a beautiful rose and you said, let me figure it out, what it's made of, and you cut it into a thousand pieces, then you got a dead rose. <laughs> and that's what we do to ourselves with our bodies. We cut ourselves into a thousand million pieces, and then nothing feels better. So the way I see it, personal growth, evolution, spiritual growth, however you look at it, it's, it's about coming more into wholeness. And we heal the cracks through forgiveness and through letting go of judgment and through letting go of energy. And we let go of energy by learning to become aware of energy. And we do that just by closing our eyes and go, and, and by going, what's going on? <laughs> and it's that simple. And some of us are feelers, some of us are seers, some of us we just know things. So you're gonna approach energy in your own unique way. But one way or another, you're gonna have to find a way to recognize when there's negativity of some sort in you and how to let it go so you can shift your energy and reset. No, no amount of positive thinking is gonna take years of pain, abuse, stuckness, and change, right? You're not gonna use an affirmation and then some deep, intense thing is just gonna decide, well, she changed her mind, I'm gonna go now, <laughs> right? Like if there's an ice pick in your back, somebody needs to pull that thing out. It might be you. And then you go stick it with someone else to make you. <laughs> Just kidding, sorry. Um, <laughs> we might find ourselves in meditation blaming someone, just going off. Have you ever done that? You just go off at someone, have this entire argument with them for like 10 minutes, and then they show up at the cafe and you're like, hey, it's so good to see you. <laughs> Love the dress. <laughs> and in your mind, it's like, <laughs> meditation is helpful. So let's just get a little bit of feedback on um, what that was like. Can I get a, a person or two sharing what that experience was like, what energy you noticed, what shifted, what didn't? Did you have a really good nap? <laughs> or was I speaking Chinese? And what was happening? Like? Anybody want to share? Or a question that you might ask? Yes, sir. Here, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Yeah, that's really good. I didn't mention the throat, but a lot of times we will have stuck energy in the space around things that we are or are not saying. Definitely. Thank you. Also, there can, I've noticed a lot of kind of intellectual energy sometimes gets stuck in this space too. And that's getting in our shoulders. We're holding the world up on our shoulders almost like energetically holding it, right? And then all that stress won't. Okay, anybody else wanna share? While it's calm? <laughs> no, good. Nobody ever wants to share when you're processing, right? Because it's deep inner stuff and it's hard to put words to. So it's okay, I'm not surprised. But I, I wanna invite you to continue, continue to even work on this one thing again uh, in other meditations. Just by a raise of hands, who here noticed uh, something to work on? Did you find something? Cool. And how many of you feel like you started to get to it? Like it started, it started to shift. Started to shift. Who here was staring at it and it just wouldn't move? Just wouldn't move. Got a couple of those. Hard to think of, but yes. Uh, that's totally fine. Sometimes things don't move for a while. We have to just like stare at them. <laughs> just stare at it in meditation and just like win out over time. Eventually it'll be like, fine, fine, you know how it really feels like. You just have to stay with it. And for me, like, I, I always say I'm not a good meditator. I'm just really persistent. Like if something is bothering me, if I'm stuck on something, sometimes I'll sit for two or three hours and I'll just go with it. 
He says, I don't work. Right? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I spent one year on prayer, but I'm meditating off of my taxes. <laughs> inner, inner exploration. <laughs> but for real, if you sit with something and you work the tools, it'll start to shift over time. It might take half an hour, it might take 10 years. Somewhere is usually in that range. <laughs> Giving you a range. At least I gave you a range. If it takes more than 10 years, then I'm guessing there's some stuff is there. There's something else going on. Uh, I had a client once, and I just asked her, I said, are, are you trying to, are, are you single? Is what I asked her. She said, yeah. I said, how long have you been single? And she said, 30 years. I said, okay. Uh, did your dad cheat on your mom? And she was like, yes. We grew up in Hollywood, we cheated all the time, and I learned from a very young age that men are never to be trusted. And so what I said to her was, you are right. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> so what, I, what, we, what we found out in this discovery was that she was stuck on this energy from her childhood, that men cannot be trusted. And so she spent 30 years creating that reality from that one experience. From that one experience, she created the next 30 years. Uh, and so we started going back in meditation, going, how can we get to that image, that memory, that energy? And how can we shift it so you can reset your energy and create something else? So sometimes, for some of us, it's very deep work like that. And other times, it's just like, oh, I just want 10% more positivity today. Just more energy, just lightness, let go of a little bit of stress. It can be that entire range. One day you sit down to meditate, it's like the deepest, darkest thing ever. And the next day you sit and it's just this beautiful, joyful stillness. And then usually what happens on those days, I get emails saying, David, I love your meditation. Thank you. Everything's going so great. I'm so happy. And then the next day I get another email, what happened? I woke up, everything's wrong. Everything, it's you. Membership canceled. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times that has happened. And, and so we have to be able to ride those waves. So consistent, healthy practice where you're not just meditating for five minutes, that's probably not going to do it. You're gonna, you have to sit longer so that these things can arrive. Even just today, we sat for, that was 30 straight minutes, and maybe you didn't even notice that because you were so busy working on yourself. So if you're busy working on something that's meaningful to you, you can sit for a really long time. So I wouldn't worry about that part. You might just have to find out what it is that you need to work on, and then how you can reset your energy. So with the few minutes that we have left, we're going to do a very short meditation to reset our energy before we leave. So let's close our eyes one more time. David, what did you do today? <laughs> there we go. I wonder if I like you to do is bring your awareness and your attention right to the top of your head. And on the top of your head, it's almost like an antenna. There's this Let's look at it together today. It's almost like a plate of energy, or like a, a flat sphere, almost. And this place in us is almost like antenna, and we walk into a room and we can sense the energy. I remember as a kid going to certain friends' houses, and I would go, oh, I hated it. The energy is so dense or negative or weird. And other places I go, oh, it's so light and loving. I never want to go back to my parents. <laughs> and so we, we get a sense from this place at the top of our heads. We start to sense it. And I want you to notice that this place can also have a color. So right now, I want you to choose a color and make this like spinning plate on top of your head. A color that works for you. 
not a color you think it should be, or a color that will make you cool. Just let one naturally arise. let it start to vibrate in that color. And not just on your head, but maybe all around you. Maybe all around you. So you don't have to match the grayness of an office, the redness of a political party. wishy-washy, orangey yellow of some person in your life that just wants to vampire suck all the energy out of you. So you can consciously decide, I'm going to set my energy at the color, the vibration that feels good to me. People can either come for the ride or not. And imagine it just like when you're in kindergarten and someone lays out the crayons and you're just like, that one. Everybody get out of the way. <laughs> you touch that one, I will bite. So just own it. This might seem incredibly simple, but it's incredibly powerful. And this color can change every time we meditate if we want. It can change from when we go to work to when we go home. And it's almost like taking your energetic pulse. So at some point you look at the top of your head and you're just in gray, maybe it's time to shift your energy. The room is getting more colorful. The energy in this room is definitely different than when we started. So we can shift our energy individually and collectively. When you're ready, one more time, take a nice big deep breath in. Nice sigh out. Ah. Slowly stretch, open your eyes. Sometimes I like to think of it like different colored yarmulkes. I don't know why when I have our, my markets, they were always black. I was like, can we get some color up in here? <laughs> Maybe that's all the religious traditions. I don't know the traditions. One way or another, they're doing that, right? Or a baseball hat, right? Or a cap. Everyone's got the same cap, colored cap. They're all kind of matching that. But in your own space, in your own meditation, in your own life, you can just match yourself when you want to. You don't have to match everyone else. So that's kind of a nice tool to recognize, like, am I becoming this group, or am I myself? Uh, so I hope I left you guys with some good tools today. Uh, that was the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole iceberg of pain we'll work on next time, just saying. Uh, <laughs> but I really appreciate your time and your energy, and everyone did so good. So uh, thank you all so much. I hope we'll be back next semester, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Hopefully you go back with a little bit more awareness, a little bit more amusement, and you know, juice in your sip. Thank you guys.